Second Peter 3, uh, we are into uh, an interesting portion of Scripture. I'll get into that a little bit more here in a second. But let me read and just uh, pray for us, and then we'll start. Second Peter 3, 1, here's what it says. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, and both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandment of us, the apostles, of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they, willing, are, they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished, but the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. The one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but his long-suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervor and heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervor and heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a, and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Let's pray together. Father, as we start into this third chapter, this third division of the book tonight, Lord, we're going to look at what the false teachers believe, what they teach, what they're a little bit more about their doctrine. And so I pray, because this is so prevalent today, I pray that, Father, that we would be attentive and that you would teach us and that we would be very aware that what Peter talked about in his day exists today. And so, Lord, open our hearts and our minds. Everything planned for the week, let it be blocked out so that we can comprehend what is before us, and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So to begin with, here's what I want to do. Uh, we're talking about what do false teachers believe, or we could have called it the doctrine of the false teachers. I want to read the introduction, then I'll comment a little bit more. Watch this. It says, tonight in our study of Second Peter, we have come to chapter 3, where Peter is now going to share with us the doctrine of, fa of the false teachers. He's written about the need for spiritual growth in chapter 1 and about the characteristics of false teachers in chapter 2. Now we're going to see two doctrines of the, of the Word of God which they want to cast doubt upon. What, what we are going to see as we step into this chapter and as we look at their doctrine is that what they taught in Peter and Jude's day is the very false teaching that has been adopted by most of society and sad to say has also been adopted by many professing believers today. This morning I said something. I said if you, if you have kids in public schools today or you have grandkids in public schools, most likely they have been impacted by this doctrine, by this teaching. It's called uniformitarianism, and we're not going to get into it a whole lot tonight. But basically, that sounds like a word that's difficult to understand, and you would scratch your head and say, what in the world is that? Well, just to make it plain and simple, because I'm plain and simple. And I read over it and so uh, studied it, and so here's what I come away with. It is the teaching that you can look at what exists today and decide by what exists today about how things were thousands of years ago. That's why, watch verse 4, if you would, and I'll show it to you. Watch this. And saying, where's the promise of his coming? Watch this. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. No catastrophic events 
None of that. Everything slowly has just evolved over time. That is that teaching. That insert that into the schools today, and that brings you into evolution, is what that does. That's exactly what this is. That over time, slowly over time, things have evolved in our world. And so and the reason they teach that is because they say, well, look around. You can make that call today because you don't see any quick changes today. It takes a long time for things to change. And, and it doesn't just happen overnight. But we know that whenever the flood came, that it happened suddenly. And the world, uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, continents were changed, and then the flood receded, and then I believe, as I've taught you, that's whenever the Ice Age came during that time, and things drastically changed all over the earth, the, the climates and, and everything. You say, was there climate change? Yeah, there was back then compared to what there was before the flood came. But these false teachers don't want to accept what the Bible teaches. They don't want to accept that. And they have that uniformitarianism. In other words, everything's always been this way, and it just slowly over time, through evolution, things change. And, I, and as I have on your paper, there are a lot of believers that have bought into that. You would, you would probably be amazed if you knew how many believers today would believe in evolution. Now, it, they might label it as what's known as, and we talked a little bit about this whenever we came through the first 11 chapters of Genesis, is there is a teaching known as theistic evolution. What that is, is this. They believe that God started it all, and then he just backed off and took his hands off and left it go. And it's just over the years, it has evolved into where it is. Not only that, they have bought, uh, many believers have bought into the fact that the earth is millions of years old or billions of years old. And a lot of that comes from a teaching in the in a book of Genesis that is known as the gap theory. That be between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, that there is a huge gap of years that God created uh, did the first creation and then then they say then that's whenever satan fell and and there was chaos came on the earth and then then god started all over again and that's what you pick up whenever you go to chat to verse two of chapter one and it's and it's all over again but they want to insert a huge gap between verses one and verse and verse two but there are so many problems with that because then what you're teaching is this that you are teaching that sin entered into the world before Adam. And in the book of Romans, we're told that sin came into the world through one man, and that was Adam. Not somebody or some way before him, but through Adam. That's how sin got in the world. Not only another problem with that, if you look at the verses in Genesis chapter 1, they all start with a connective, the word and. And, 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 and. That leaves no room for gaps. It leaves no room for gaps whatsoever. So I say all that to say this, that Peter was way ahead of his day whenever he was here teaching what they are going to what they're going to be bringing on the scene. And we're going to talk a little bit about it tonight. We're just going to kind of set it up for next week is what we're going to do. But uh, yeah, Peter was Peter was way ahead of his day because what he taught there needs to be taught today because it's prevalent today and it is crept into society and, and like i said it's got into many churches the whole thing with evolution you know uh, what's happened is that that people trust those that refer to themselves as scientists and say well the scientists say that the earth is millions of years old and so we've got to somehow some way incorporate that into the scriptures that's how the gap theory came about that that's how that teaching of that gap between one and two of genesis chapter one came about because they had accepted the fact that the that the scientists say the world's millions of years old so what are we going to do with that because we know that if you if you run the dates through the scriptures the earth is about six thousand years old so what are we going to do with a million and six thousand and then you have six thousand over here how are you going to or billions and you're going to have six thousand over here how are you going to work that out well if we insert a gap there between one and two of genesis one 
then that's no problem. We'll put the millions or billions of years in that gap, and then we'll go 6,000 years from there. That's what's happened. That's what's happened. And so, anyhow, we'll see all that as we go through here. So, the first point that we come to tonight is another reminder. Remember, remember uh, Peter, Peter had a purpose statement, basically, in chapter 1, and it, uh, it started in... Uh, it started in verse 12 of chapter 1, and it went through, uh, let me see here, verse 15. That was the first purpose statement. Whenever he realized that his day was approaching whenever he was going to die, and he was going uh, he was, he was to die like the Lord had showed him, uh, verse 14 of chapter 1 says this, knowing that, I, that shortly I must put off this, my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. So he, he said to them there that, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remind you of things that you need, basics. He's going to do the same thing here. Watch verse 1 of chapter 3. He says, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Let's just flip back. Come back to chapter 1. Let me, let me just read something. Watch, uh, watch verse uh, 12, 13, and 14. Let me read these. It says, verse 12 says, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance, there's the word again, of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that surely I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me, let me catch verse 15, moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. So you see what he's doing, and then he stops here for a moment again, and in verses 1 and 2, he's going to do the same thing again of chapter 3. He's going to make what's known as a purpose statement. So in verse 1, let me read it again. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds, by way of remembrance. Come back to your paper. Watch this. This is the second time that Peter pauses to tell his readers his purpose for writing. His desire was to remind his readers of that which they already knew. Give, basically, what he's saying is, don't forget the basics. He was stirring up their minds to help them to remember. This is something that all of us need from time to time. We can learn many truths from the Word of God, but if we're not in situations where we are applying them constantly, then we all have the tendency to forget over time. It's great, it's a, it's great to study the Bible and learn things that we have not known before, but the study of the Bible is often reviewing what we already know so that we might be reminded. This is what gives spiritual strength and discernment to each of us. So what we need to do is we need to go back to the basics a lot of times, just review over. And that's, you know, uh, I know as a, as a pastor teacher that it, sometimes you can put pressure on yourself to try to come up with something new. And I've learned over time there isn't anything new. Just like, we, just like this morning's message on John 3.16. Nothing new in that message, but one that was vitally important that needed to be heard. So it's no different with the, all the fundamentals of the Scriptures, and that's what Peter's concerned about. Watch verse 2. Watch this. Because this verse, watch this now, it is very, very important. That ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Come back to your paper once. Watch this. Here's a very important verse. We're told here in this verse where we go for spiritual strength. There are many ideas which people have. Some will say it's best to read the writings of others, and some say that we need to find some good seminars to attend. Both of these can be helpful, but I'm careful with that. It says, but it should say, if we look closely at the verse, neither of these are mentioned. Watch verse 2 again, and I'll break these down. It says that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. If you are a note taker in your Bible, write down Old Testament right there. That's what that is. The words which were spoken by the whole, before by the holy prophets. Watch the next one. And the commandment of us, the apostles, write down there, New Testament. That verse confirms both the Old and the New Testament are scriptures. 
Watch your paper. I, I have it here on the bottom. It says, words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, this is the Old Testament. The commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, this is the New Testament. This verse does something that is very important. It confirms the Old Testament writings of Scripture, and it's easy to find verses that do that. But watch what else it does. It confirms the New Testament writings of Scripture. That is hard to find. You don't get many verses that do that. This is where we are to gather our knowledge and truth. The Gnostics, the false teachers, would come. They would come in, and they would teach that the church needed, should say churches, need secret knowledge the knowledge which they possessed but the truth is that as believers we need the knowledge from the word of god and that's what peter's saying right here that you may be mindful of the old testament writings and the new testament writings the scriptures that's where you get your knowledge you don't that's not some secret knowledge that the gnostics have and there, listen there are people today in churches in some denominations and they feel that they are on a higher level because they have gotten uh truth that they feel nobody else has the problem with a lot of that is what they have is not truth it is deception and they have been deceived in what they believe and so you and i need to go back to the scripture so let, let me get you back to this once again watch this I know we have looked at this many times, but I'm going to follow Peter's lead and remind all of us that uh, the means which God has provided for us to be equipped is the Word of God. That's what it is. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it, watch this, with the washing of water by the Word. That's an important statement that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The way in which God cleanses the church and sanctifies, I should add that in there, sanctifies, sets us apart, uh, the, the church or the body of Jesus Christ, is by the spoken word. The word word here refers to spoken word. That's what it means. If you go and you look up where it says, with the washing of water by the word, if you look that up in Vine's dictionary, you'll find out that it's a reference to the spoken word. Okay, now watch this. The church has been ordained by God as a training ground for the saints where the word of God is to be given top priority so that the saints will be cleansed and equipped, sanctified, set apart with the washing of water by the word that's why it's so significant so important that you and i get underneath the word of god the spoken word of god that's why it's so important from the pulpit that the word of god is taught and that and and that you can be underneath that because that is what sanctifies that is what cleanses that is what the spirit of god uses in your life to equip you so that you don't fall for something like right here in chapter three when these when these uh, false teachers come along and say all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation there's never been any catastrophes we we, we can just rely on uniformitarianism right now and no problem at all and you say absolutely not because we know that the bible teaches different okay so let me go back here Ephesians 4, you know the verses. I've used them so many times. And speaking of this, of the blueprint for the church, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Here's the reason. Here's why God ordained the church and gave gifted men that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive that's why we need to be rooted and grounded you remember i told you back a couple weeks ago there were several winds that blew through our land over i don't know how far they go back uh, just a reference, remember the prayer of Jabez. You remember there was a book written on the prayer of Jabez. Uh, the uh, the Purpose Driven Church, that was another one that a lot of people, by Rick Warren. I'm going to give you a quote from him tonight, or or at least an, an idea, not, an, not a quote, but you can get it out of his book, 
uh, the Purpose Driven Church, and I hope that you don't have it. I had one one time, and it made excellent kindling uh, in the wood burner, so I just burned it all up uh, because it's really, it's garbage. You don't need that. You don't need that. There was, uh, there was another movement. You remember the Promise Keepers? That was another one. They, these are just... Uh, these are just things, and every so often, and we're about due for one, really. We're about due for something to come through and sweep through the land, some kind of movement. And so what it'll do is, uh, I'll tell you another one that came through. Remember the blood moons? Remember that? And Dale came and taught about how that was all fallacy in the midst of all of that. But anyhow, uh, these things, they, 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 they'll come through. They'll sweep through. A lot of people will jump right onto that and tag on to that. that that's what this says right here that whenever we are rooted and grounded in the word of god we're not carried about with every wind of doctrine and the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive we don't get caught up in that and i'm telling you like i said that last one was the blood moons and that was i remember this distinctly it was whenever we were digging the hole out front for the new church sign I, I only know that because some guy showed up to help that didn't even come here and and told me all about how the things because of Hagee's book the world was going to change it was something drastic coming and it was going to turn the world upside down and guess what here we are right now here we are and those blood moons that they were talking about were that were going to show up in the sky whenever the whenever the moon is red just so you know this if you get up in the night and the moon's red and you think uh oh what's going on that means there's a lot of dust in the air that's what does that it gives it a red hue so that's the cause of dust though and i guess you could apply that in that same situation they kicked up the dust for a while uh but that all went away didn't it that all went away and so they were what i'm going to call fads they sweep through that's why we need to be rooted and grounded in what we in, in the scriptures otherwise we're caught up in that now watch this now there are believers who see themselves as strong and have no need to have the word poured over them and for those individuals i would point out several verses first corinthians 10 and 12 wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall okay you be very careful i, I hope that's not you you're here tonight and you want to learn so i hope that's not you and then the words of paul these are probably we've used these a couple times the words of paul to the the apostle to the elders at ephesus elders these were the leaders at the church at ephesus these were the guys that that could step in and they could teach paul said this take heed therefore acts 20 28 to 30 take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the holy ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of god which which he hath purchased with his own blood for i know this that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you not sparing the flock also of your own selves shall men arise catch that of your own selves right out of this group of guys that he's talking to of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them the the elders taught by paul were in danger of deception how much more are we in danger and how much more do we need a word of god if those guys that were taught by paul personally taught by him if they were in danger of deception i say this we too are in danger of deception and so back to peter's purpose statement that's what that is it's the second one he says look get in the word be mindful of the words that were spoken in the old testament and in the new testament then we come to this point their attack on true doctrine watch uh watch three through six watch what they do knowing this first that there shall come in the last days scoffers there's an important word we'll come back to that walking after their own lusts and saying where's the promise of his coming for since the fathers fell asleep all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation for this they willingly are ignorant of we'll talk about that next week in other words they deliberately decide not to believe what the scriptures say and even to deny evidence today okay but watch this that by the word of god the heavens were of old and the earth standing out in the water and in the water whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished okay back to your paper watch this there's one doctrine which the false teachers will attack surprisingly 
They're not going after the doctrine of the resurrection or the doctrine of the deity of Jesus Christ or the virgin birth. They, they're none of those. They're, the doctrine which they will attack is the doctrine of the return of Jesus Christ. They raise the question, where is the promise of his coming? You see that? That's what they say right there in verse 4. And saying, where is the promise of of his coming you say he's coming back where is it is that's the one they attack that's the one that they deny now without running too far out ahead and getting into next week into that study you say why would they attack that why would they why would they why would they come up against that they're going to come up against that and they're going to come up against the flood too and i'll just give you a little peek out in advance if you're living like these guys are living, these Gnostics, and teaching licentiousness that, that you can go ahead and live to please the flesh and get into whatever you want, the last thing you want is for Jesus to come back because that's going to make you accountable, isn't it? It's going to make you accountable. And so if you wonder, what's the attack on this? That's it. There's another one with the flood, but we'll get into that, and I don't want to go too far ahead. So come back here again to your paper, middle of that paragraph. Uh, we will get to this doctrine and why they attack it in a moment, but, and that'll be next week. But first I want to see what they do, because this is important to understand. I want you to see their means of attack. It, they, don't, they don't come with weapons, so to speak. They don't come in with a with swords or guns and they're not going to come in and beat you up that's not what they're going to do watch verse 3 again knowing this first that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts what's your paragraph they will scoff or mock those who believe in the second coming of jesus christ the gnostics especially will go after this doctrine because they believe everything Physical is bad, and therefore they do not believe in a bodily return of Jesus, nor do they believe in a physical earthly kingdom, nor do they want to believe in it, as we'll see. But let's get to the ridicule and the scoffing, because that's what it is. It is ridicule. We can read over this very quickly and miss just how terrible this is if we're not careful. If you have ever been mocked or ridiculed, you know how it makes you feel. This is an effective tool used by Satan to hinder believers from serving the Lord. When we are mocked or ridiculed, there is a tendency to pull back from taking a stand, especially if we are the only person standing in that circle. Mo mocking and ridicule, that, I, I don't care who you are, if you are not rooted and you are not grounded, that is extremely difficult to deal with because nobody wants to be ridiculed and if and if somebody comes at you and they want to mock you and they want to ridicule you because you believe in the return of christ then i'm telling you what it's going to do if there's not more like you standing around you you're going to want to withdraw from that that whole scene because you don't want to deal with that mocking and that ridicule watch this I just noticed some examples of the enemy using ridicule. Okay, so I'll show you. This is, a, this is nothing new. In Ezra uh, chapter 2, dealing with uh, building the temple. Ezra chapter 4, 2 through 5, here's what it says. Then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said to them, This is the enemy. Let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do. And we do sacrifice unto him since the day of Ezra Hadan, king of Asher, which brought us up hither. But Zerubbabel and Joshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel. As King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. This is when they, after they returned, remember that? This is the first wave that comes back to build the temple. They built the altar first, and then whenever they started to build the temple, this happened, and it shut them down for 15 years, so you know what you're about to read was very effective. Verse 4, 
Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building. Watch how they did it. And hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Fifteen years. They did this, and it, and it ceased the building project for 15 years. Watch, then, then along comes Nehemiah, okay? Nehemiah comes in, and, and, and they're going to build. Nehemiah goes back, and, and he's going to build the wall, and it's not going to be any different. Watch this, Nehemiah chapter 4, 1 through 3. But it came to pass when Sambalat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth, and he took indignation and mocked the Jews. There it is. It's the same thing. It's the scoffing, the mocking, the ridicule. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, Watch this. What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rub rubbish which are burned? In other words, they're saying, You think you can build something out of this? No way. Watch this. Verse 3. Now Tobiah, the Ammonite, was by him, and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. In other words, you guys don't even know what you're doing. You're no stone builders. You're no stone masons. You don't know what you're doing building the wall. And so they kept at it and at it and at it. And it was a battle. What? what? Let me go on. Two times the enemy tried to frustrate the Jews with ridicule. Once when they were building the temple and when they were building the wall, these were difficult times to work through. Notice the words of Nehemiah. Watch what he says about this. For they, they all made us afraid. They were afraid. They were terrified. It's no fun to be ridiculed. It's no fun to be mocked. It's saying their hands shall be weakened from the work that it be not done. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. And he did, and they got the work done. But I show you all that to know that you can read right over verse 3 and you think, well, that's not a big deal. But listen, l let me say this. So your grandkids or your children, they go off to public school and they get in the classroom and you've taught them about creation and they know that God has created the world. And then they go in a classroom and the teacher begins to present uniformitarianism aka evolution and your child says something and the teacher comes back and says you are wrong with what you believe there listen that's extremely difficult for a young person and uh, you say well that's a pretty unique situation no it isn't that happens all the time that happens all the time and, and I'm telling you, if you've ever been ridiculed by anybody, it, it is no fun to go through that. It is no fun. It's a very effective way of discouraging God's people. Let me go back to your paper. If you're not grounded in the Word and you face ridicule, you will be set back, and most likely you're going to pull back because no one likes to be ridiculed or mocked, and it can be very difficult to deal with and to work through. I'm telling you, because they're just the human nature. People, you, you and I want to be accepted. We want to be accepted. And so when, this, when it turns on us, it's hard to deal with. Let me go on. Now let us get to the false teacher's attack on the doctrine of the second coming. Watch verse 4 again, just the first part. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? So what you, what you got to understand, and I'm going to show you here in a moment, is that they, in the midst of this, they are casting doubt on the Word of God. Watch your paper. We will get to, this, to their reasoning in a few minutes, when, and I put that on before I realized I wasn't going to get that far. Uh, I should say in a few messages. But let us first look at what they are saying. They will deny the second coming of Jesus Christ, which is something that the Bible is very clear about. Zechariah 14, 1 through 4. It says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and, the, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. 
and his feet shall stand, here it comes, in that day upon the Mount of Olives. There's the earthly return of Christ, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a great valley, a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. Crystal clear that there's a return. Watch what Job said in Job 19, 25 through 27, 26. He said, I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Watch this one. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. You know what else he talked about? The oldest book in the Bible, and he talked about a resurrection, didn't he? He looked forward to the resurrection. He knew he would die and that his body would go back to the dust, but he knew that he would stand and that he would see God with his own eyes but in that first verse verse 25 he says that our lord shall stand at the latter day upon the earth that's the return of christ then you have matthew what jesus taught in matthew 24 27 through 31 it says this for as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west so shall also the coming of the son of man be for wheresoever the carcass is there will the eagles be gathered together Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So Jesus himself talked about his earthly return. And then you have the actual account, Revelation 19, 11 through 15. And I saw heaven open to behold a white horse. He that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth go a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and treadeth, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. It's just a few of the passages that speak of the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's just a few of them. But they will deny it. They will deny it, and they will do everything they can to scoff at those that believe in the return of Christ, the earthly return of Christ, saying, where is the promise of his coming? It's, it's going on today. I'm telling you, it's going on today. Let me, let me tell you a story, uh, if I could, and then I'm going to get into something here in just a little bit. But uh, the false teaching, not especially what is here but just false teaching that you and I have to be aware of uh, exists even in our little towns today at Homewood there was a lady that waited for me after we were finished up there she's a lady that works there uh, and she waited and I I noticed that in her eyes there were tears before I got to her and Whenever I got to her, she said, Pastor, can I talk to you? And I said, sure you can. And she said, I need you to pray for my daughter. And I said, I certainly will. And she proceeded to tell me that her daughter works at a place in Everett. And that establishment has brought in people that are teaching the employees to talk to the dead and to talk to angels, to be able to, tuned in, to be tuned in to be able to hear that. I kind of, at first it's like, am I hearing what I'm hearing? She said, Pastor, you have no idea what they have brought in. You have none. They have the meetings in their buildings, and they bring these people in. And, they have, and, and she said, and my daughter is bought into that. That is satanic. That is satanic. That is straight from the pit of hell, contacting the dead. Just go back and read 
I don't know if it's first or second Samuel. I think it's first Samuel. Read what Saul did when he wanted to, when he went to the witch of Endor because he wanted to call up the dead. He wanted to call up Samuel. The message he got wasn't what he wanted. That's for sure. But anyhow, I say that to say this exists. This is not, we listen to this and we brush it off and we go on. And, and, and you think, well, you know, I can keep an eye on things at school. You don't think about sending your child, your, your daughter or your son out to work somewhere and to think that they're going to plug into something right in the place where they work, where people are going to bring these groups in that are going to teach these kind of things on how to communicate with the dead and, and how to communicate and talk to angels and hear angels. Just ridiculous. But I'm, I just give you that to help you to know that don't think we're secluded in our little corner of the world because we are not. It's here. It's here now. You don't have to go very far. Listen, I, I know back a couple years ago, uh, before I came to Claysburg, that would have been in 2001, whenever God called me to the Claysburg Bible Church, that I had candidated at a church in uh, Berkeley Springs, West Virginia, down there, at Calvary Bible Church or something. I don't remember what the name of it was. And uh, almost ended up going down to uh, Berkeley Springs, West Virginia. Almost ended up going down there. And then just didn't feel comfortable and all that said to say that uh, come to find out years later that Berkeley Springs is a very dark town. It's a beautiful little place to ride through. You know, they got the springs there and everything. But there are a lot of shops that are connected with witchcraft and what I'm going to say, satanic things in that little town. Very quaint little town. Uh, we go through it a uh, couple times a year. But a very dangerous town at the same time. Very dangerous. Uh, because of what's there. A lot of, it's a, it's a, what I call a bedroom community for D.C. because a lot of people live there and then commute down towards the, the city out of Berkeley Springs because then it's not too far of a run. But anyhow, I, I'm just saying that to help you to understand that it's not just attacking the doctrine of the second coming of Christ. Those false teachers, that danger exists all over the place. Okay, and sometimes it even comes from people that profess to be believers. Watch your paper again. I'll pick that paragraph back up. These are just some of the passages that speak of the second coming of Jesus Christ. There are even professing believers who will ridicule us for even being concerned about the coming of Jesus Christ. Two guys I'm going to point out here. Rick Warren in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, says that if we are interested in prophecy, then we have been distracted by Satan. 20, the Bible is 25% prophecy. And Rick Warren says, if you're interested in that, then you have been distracted by Satan. That's satanic. Uh, you think that's something? Watch the next one. Notice the words of Mark Dever, who is the theologian and the senior pastor of the Capitol Hills Baptist Church, Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. Well, you can Google this. It's right online. You get this right there. He said this, and I quote, I think that millennial views need not be among those doctrines that divide us. In other words, if it, we shouldn't be divided over when Jesus is going to return. That has nothing to do with anything. That's what he's saying. Watch what he, that's how far he goes here. I'm suggesting that what you believe about the millennium, have uh, how you interpret these thousand years, is not something that is necessary for us to agree upon in order to have a congregation together. Therefore, for us to conclude that we must agree upon a certain view of alcohol or a certain view of scolding or a certain view of meat sacrificed to idols or a certain view of the millennium uh, in order to have fellowship together is, I think, n not only unnecessary for the body of Christ, but it is therefore both unwarranted and therefore condemned by Scripture. 
So if you're a pastor and you're listening to me, you understand me correctly. If you think I'm saying you're in sin, if you lead your congregation to have a statement of faith that requires a particular millennial view, I do not understand why that has to be a matter of uniformity in order to have Christian unity in a local congregation, unquote. Watch the next line. According to Mark Dever, we would be in sin because we are premillennialists, meaning that we believe that Jesus will return to the earth before the millennial kingdom. That puts us in sin, according to his definition. You see what I'm saying? That, that you don't have to go to somebody that is outside the church. These are guys that are, you know, you, you look at Dever, uh, the, he's, he's, I guess he's still there. He shouldn't be but he is, the Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington, D.C., and Rick Warren, you know, he was considered, I believe, America's pastor. These are guys that are, Warren's saying that, you know, if you're caught up in prophecy, studying the book of Revelation, then you're distracted by Satan. Dever's saying if you take a, a stand on the, on, on the millennium, then you're living in sin, and we should not teach our people to take a stand. In other words, that's all, you know what, they, 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 it's about an ecumenical movement, meaning that just set your doctrine aside and let's come together. That's what the, one of the groups I, I mentioned, uh, the uh, Promise Keepers, that's exactly what they were. They basically said this, just set your doctrine aside and let's come together in love. That's what they said. That's an ecumenical movement. So we were to compromise doctrine. And you remember what I was taught and I've told it to you many, many times, that uh, unity, Pastor Richie said this, unity at the expense of truth is treason to Jesus Christ. And we must not forget that. Unity at the expense of truth. We do not seek unity by casting truth aside. Conclusion. I wish we could have went on tonight. I, I just hate, it's like we're stopping like right at, the good part and but it's Sunday night people got to get up and go to work tomorrow and so here we go with the conclusion there's so much more for us to gather here in second Peter 3 4 which we shall get next week but let us not forget never forget that in order to stay true to God we must be in his word you know Psalm 119 105 thy word is a lamp under my feet and a light on them to my path. I'm telling you, you've got to be in it. You've got to be, and we need to give as much time here at Claysburg Bible Church to the Word of God as what we possibly can. And I really appreciate that on Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, and Wednesday nights that that opportunity is there uh, to do that, and that people are receptive. And I say this, people, wanna, people want to know, there are a lot of people that want to know the truth. I think Donnie told me this morning there was uh, 200 and I don't know what it was, 13 or something that were here this morning. Uh, people have a desire to know what the truth is. And so we need to stay true to the truth of God's word. And that equips us against these false teachers that are out there. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you so much for what Peter has penned. Lord, we, we, we only scratch the service. We just crack into chapter 3, not very far. But Lord, as we do, we get a little bit of a glimpse. We get a glimpse of the reminder and how important it is to be in the Old Testament and in the New Testament studying the Word of God, absorbing as much as what we possibly can, and then to be aware of even just the tactics of the false teachers, the scoffing, the ridicule, the mocking, and how difficult that can be to deal with. And Father, and, and then to see what they will attack, the uh, second coming of Christ, and see that it's even crept into these, uh, I'm careful, the Christian circles. Uh, Father, help us to be on guard. Help us to be always on guard, I pray. Use the messages, uh, Lord, uh, that we study and uh, to equip us. Father, now uh, we just thank you again for the day and Pray we have, might have a really good week this week and should guide and direct our steps. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Let's take a hymn. Let's turn to number 244. Number 244.